welcome to the most beautiful beach in the world. That is not me being hyperbolical. That is what The Guardian wrote in 2007. Today, I'm going to be taking you all around Galicia, which is a lesser explorer region of Spain. It's my first time here as well. We're going to be going on a road trip. We are going to be eating loads of food. And firstly, we're going to explore this island. Just a few kilometers off the northwest coast of Spain, you will find the Cias Islands, this gorgeous tropical looking archipelago. I'm surprised more people don't know about them. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd never heard the name before going to Spain. But maybe that's for the best because these islands are carefully protected as part of the Atlantic Islands National Park. And as a result, visitor numbers are limited to 2,000 a day. In fact, you have to get permission to visit before you even buy your boat ticket there. And that's just one of the ways in which the islands are protected. There are no cars or motorbikes, no hotels, no bins, no shops. There's also no fresh water, so make sure you bring your own and some sunscreen because it gets hot here. So what can you do on the islands? Well, there's snorkeling, kayaking, there's a campsite, it's basic, but it gets the job done. And I mean, imagine waking up to this. As for food, you could bring your own as long as you take all the trash back with you because there are no bins on the island either. But better yet, there are three small restaurants where you can eat freshly caught fish straight off the grill from mackerel and sardines to turbot. I was too early for lunch, so I grabbed a Galician empanada with eggs and tuna instead and a milky coffee. And after my meal, I went hiking to learn about the local plants and admire all the wildlife. We have many of these places, many of these planted dunes, such as here. And we have a wealth of uh, species of plants mm -hmm. in, in this kind of ecosystem. So we have lots and lots of them. I visited in the autumn, so I basically had the CS Islands all to myself. It was an absolutely epic day. And in the afternoon, I headed to my next spot. Ferries sail to and from the CS Islands from several nearby towns, including Vigo, Cangas, and Bayona. I chose Bayona because there is a lot to see in this small town and to eat, as it turns out. This restaurant, Pedro Madruga, is right in the harbor and frankly, a little fancier than the places I would usually eat at, but I got to Bayona at that awkward in-between time where nearly all the restaurants are closed and so I didn't have much choice. And you know what? In the end, I was so glad I ended up eating there because they had this regional specialty on the menu, goose barnacles. I'd never heard of them before, but as it turns out, they are one of the most expensive seafood varieties in the world at more than $100 per pound. So goose barnacles, are this pricey because harvesting them is super dangerous. Fishermen have to scale sharp rocks, they have to swim through underwater cave along Galicia's aptly named Coast of Death in order to gather these. Put your thumb in here, you pull down, this is what you get. It's good. Of course it's good. I was a little fearful. <laughs> it's very good. It tastes literally just like the sea. The sea. Yeah. But in a good way. It doesn't taste like oysters. No. Nope. It doesn't taste like octopus. It doesn't. It's quite unique, isn't it? Mm. It's good. Mm. Okay. Now let's talk about Bayona, the town itself. My first stop was the Church of Santa Maria of Bayona. Not a particularly big or famous church, but in my opinion, a really beautiful one. I felt this real sense of tranquility as I explored it. And then I continued my stroll around the town, going into yet another church and then just soaking up the atmosphere. Because walking through Bayona's narrow cobbled streets really makes it easy to forget you're in the 21st century. And that's a good thing because it makes it easier to imagine the historical event that Bayona is most famous for, the arrival of La Pinta in 1493. Now, if you don't know what La Pinta is, don't worry, I didn't know it by its name alone either, but I'm pretty confident you've heard of it because La Pinta is one of the three Spanish ships that Christopher Columbus used on his first transatlantic voyage in 1492. Now, I have many reservations about Lowell Chris with his absolutely abhorrent treatment of indigenous people, but seeing a replica of the ship that introduced Europeans to the entire American continent, imagining it sailing into this picture's harbor it was pretty surreal our next stop is Sobrado Abbey. This Cistercian monastery was founded back in 952 AD and it flourished for centuries until it was forcefully dissolved in 1835 during a period known in Spain as La Desamortización. <laughs> Let me try that again. La Desamortización. 
I think, I, whatever, this. Um, that's a period when many ancient monasteries were expropriated and privatized during the reign of Queen Isabel II of Spain. After 1835, these abandoned buildings fell into decay for more than 100 years, and the monks only returned in 1966, and now the Abbey is a very popular tourist spot for those visiting Galicia. Now, it's at this point I should probably mention one of the most notable things about Galicia from a tourism perspective. Its capital, Santiago de Compostela, is the endpoint of the Camino de Santiago or the Way of St. James, one of the most famous pilgrimage routes in the world. Now, it's not just one set route, but a series of them, including the Ruta de Carvallera in Sobrado. I'm, tr I'm trying with these pronunciations. Now, I know I called the Camino a pilgrimage, but if you're imagining a load of old Catholic men in flowing robes traipsing across Europe, I will have to disappoint you. Although it is a spiritual experience for many people who walk it, the route is mainly a very long hike and is popular among hikers regardless of their faith or lack thereof. The pilgrims, as they're referred to, usually walk from the southern tip of France across the Pyrenees and along the north of Spain all the way to Galicia. For the most part, they stay in small hostels and guest houses along the way. You can even stay in converted monastery quarters like Sobrado Abbey. The landscape is varied, but the locals here swore this area of Spain is the most beautiful of the entire route. Now, are they biased? Obviously, but do they have a point? I think so. Now, speaking of beauty, for lunch, I headed to a place called Casa de Queixa, which translates to house of cheese. I mean, what a place. All of their ingredients are locally produced, farmed and grown in the region. And I was very excited to try them all. Now, first I tried some cured ham and tortilla cheese, which is a cow's milk cheese made in the region. And then I had some Albarina wine to wash it down. I honestly know nothing about wine, but it was white and it was delicious. For my main, I had locally farmed chicken, but dessert is what we really need to talk about. Galicia cheesecake oh my god it's creamy it's fluffy airy sweet absolutely delicious and this is how they serve coffee by the way in a little bowl plus i also had these liqueurs which um have three flavors there is a traditional coffee one herbal and a creamy one that's a lot like bailey's after lunch, I headed to Abero de Loba. By the way, if you're thinking these names are a little strange, like they're Spanishy, but they don't sound quite Spanish, you're spot on. These names are all in Galician, which is the local language that is spoken in this region. Now back to Abero de Loba. It's a newly renovated farmhouse that offers accommodation to tired pilgrims along the Camino de Santiago. I met the owner who told me a little more about its history. It used to be a, a farmhouse, something completely different. Uh... From now. My grandparents were the last generation living here. The early 60s, they moved to the city with my father. My father lived here until he was 10 years old. Now, I guess renovating a 300 year old farmhouse didn't keep him busy enough because he also decided to start a unique project growing shiitake mushrooms, which he uses when cooking for the guests. Now they break the I don't know the name, the bark. The bark. The bark, exactly. Thanks. Okay. And uh, what they do is they, they feed from the inside of the log. They last for four or five years. Just a short drive away is the picturesque town of Betanzos, which boasts one of the best preserved old quarters in all of Galicia. Now, probably the most famous building there is the St. Francis Church, built in 1387. It is full of elaborate hunting scenes, including these um, anatomically correct statues of a bear and a wild boar. Absolutely loved it. Moving on from Betanzos, it's about a 20 minute drive to A Coruña, the biggest city in Galicia by population size. I'll be honest, I had never heard of it before Galicia as a tourist destination definitely flies under the radar so every place in this video was new to me now having said that my boyfriend had heard of A Coruña because their football team apparently is very famous Deportivo de la Coruña also if you're a big art buff you might know that Picasso once lived here and there is an entire house museum dedicated to him I didn't get much of a chance to explore, but I did see the lighthouse in Sunset, the only still working Roman lighthouse from the second century. The view was pretty memorable, as was the Galician beefsteak I ordered for dinner. Delicious. Then the next morning I headed to Castello de Vimianzo. It's a 13th century fortress and one of the best preserved in Galicia. Inside, I was surprised to find a group of ladies making traditional lace, which you can buy there for really good prices, by the way, like non-touristy prices. There's also an ethnographic museum inside, which has examples of other crafts like ceramics, clogs, and linen. And now it's time to travel further south and even further back in time, all the way to the Iron Ages. This archeological site has turned up objects 
dating as far back as the 9th century BC and is definitely worth visiting with a guide so you can make sense of all these stone remains. I found it pretty incredible that you can just walk around at your leisure. I personally find a place like this so much more interesting than say a world famous spot like Stonehenge in England where you're only able to gawk from very very far away. Speaking of Stonehenge, our next stop has many ties to it. Dolmen de Dombate is an impressively large megalithic tomb dating back to 3700 BC, arguably one of the most valuable in Spain. You can't enter the original tomb, obviously, but there is a full-size replica inside the visitor center, which you can walk through and you will even see renditions of the petroglyphs that they found inside. Continuing our road trip further south still, this is Cabo Villan, a cape located on the Costa de Morte or the coast of death. When I saw a photo of this lighthouse, I redid the entire itinerary because it looked so epic. Just sitting there dramatically perched on top of the rock it was worth the detour. I went on a little foraging hike around the area, but even if you don't have time to spend there, go see it. And if you're a photographer, go see it at sunset. Now it's time for another food spot, this time in the port town of Porto de Fistera. There are lots of seafood restaurants along the coast, and according to my guide, it doesn't really matter which one you go for. Now I can neither confirm nor deny that because I only stopped for one meal, but it was delicious, especially the razor clams and the octopus plus I also had cheesecake and Galician almond cake for dessert both thoroughly recommended then with my belly full I made two final stops on my trip around this rugged Spanish region Cabo Fistera just outside of Puerto de Fistera derives from the Latin finis terre meaning end of the earth because this was believed to be the end of the world in Roman times that's a pretty romantic description for what for me ended up being the absolute worst part of the trip every single tourist in the area Area seems to come here because it's it's a famous landmark. Personally, I would say save yourself the trip and head straight to Fervenza do Ezero, our next stop. This gently cascading waterfall is popular among tourists as well, but if you visit late in the afternoon, you will practically have it to yourself. And uh, if you don't mind getting a little wet, you can even rent a kayak and get really close to the waterfall. You can touch it, you can swim around it. And th that's just epic. I also loved watching the local ladies make traditional lace. Now, yes, they are there for the tourists, so there is an element of artifice but they're not at all pushy they're so friendly and the lace they make once again is absolutely gorgeous and that concludes our trip around galicia i really hope you enjoyed learning about this region it's been a whirlwind week there's been a lot of driving but i'll say it's been absolutely worth it it's a nice place to come to because it's not too overrun with tourists yet and but well, there's a lot to see